Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was telling Lisa and then Dr. Badia this morning that uh, both myself and the Uber driver last night was the first time coming to the North Chicago Waukegan area. So he's able to add that to his map and he knows how to get back and forth now. But it was, uh, it's been a very pleasant trip and uh, perfect weather for uh, talking about some educational uh, things that we can be doing at SIU School of Medicine. Uh, so I'm hoping to uh, put um, together uh, a, a, a talk today about the use of patient cases. But I'm going to do it in the context of how we use it in our curriculum, uh, sort of an overview, how it fits in, but at the same time uh, showing you access to how we actually author these patient cases and change them on the fly. It's nice that I don't have to stand in front of the room over there because I, I walk around. And that explains the reason why I do a lot of things during the curriculum. I will do them on the fly. So if a student notices something or one of the faculty members notices something, we can make a change instantaneously. And by the time we open up the resource, it's already been updated. So I'm going to hopefully give you some aspects of how it fits into a curriculum, how it can be used, but then some of the nitty-gritty details, the things you can do with certain of the resources. Um, and I'm going to talk about resources outside of desire to learn V2L, because as I think we're all aware, there's some good things about V2L and then some really evil things associated with the system. And uh, I was telling Lisa this morning, we discovered one of the evil things last week, the week before our assessments end of unit assessments where all of the audio and images uh, fell to work on D2L. We had to scramble at the last minute. But anyway, uh, when one is considering the development of patient cases uh, and their use, you need to first think about how your curriculum is designed. That is, what's the mission of the curriculum? What spirit or what sense of community you're trying to develop in terms of educational goals and then how you're going to carry out those goals. So there's a number of different things that one can think about. So one can go to the L LCME website and look at all the objectives that are there. I won't go to that link right now. Um, or one can take a look at the USMLE. They publish content outline and this is nice because it shows a reflection of what in general, medical schools are teaching and what they can probe on their different step exams. And now I'll warn you that there's two camps that are have developed in the United States. There's a camp that looks at the USMLE and they say, you tell us what you're testing on and we're going to develop our curriculum around that. And the other camp, uh, which I'll tell you right now I belong to, is we tell them what we do and we like them to assess. Uh, in a broad sense to see whether they've learned something based on what the mission of our school is. So it's really specific to what we're doing. But there are curricula that take either one of the approaches, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily, uh, except there's some other players in this game that are outside that would love to be driving what medical schools teach. Uh, but one needs to think about competencies and make sure you're producing someone who can think on their feet, they can reason through problems. So you really need to take a look at what your curriculum wants to do and then how best to incorporate different features. One of the things that struck me very early on in uh, the teaching of biochemistry is students would look at the biochemists and treat us as if we were teaching in a foreign language. And I remember a comment from years ago, one of the students wrote, uh, biochemistry is Chinese, is the Chinese language to me. I can't even read it out of a textbook, let alone understand it. So a lot of the things that you think about doing with patient cases is, uh, is addressed to uh, making it understandable to them. Give them examples that they can continuously practice and revisit so they can start building the skills that we want to need. And then we do various things in our curriculum where we have lots of resource materials, not on, not on like many other schools and medicines out there. And then things that I've done specifically that help students out are just coming in who 
who have not seen biochemistry before, but that's changing because the new MCAT now tests on biochemistry. So there's this now built-in uh, incentive for students to be prepared in biochemistry, which I think is going to do nothing but help us uh, in terms of what we do. Now, one thing I do want to just spend a, a minute uh, telling you about is this Pathways for Human Metabolism. And this is exciting because the National Board, uh, I hope I am delivering uh, news to you, and we will go to this. This is a uh, version of the Stanford uh, Pathways of Human Metabolism map that they've developed over the years. And the NBME, the USMLE, have adopted this map for use on the step exam. So this is going to become a reference, just like laboratory values. So students will be able to pull up this metabolic map and use it during the step exams. So we're encouraging and getting word out to all the departments, as many departments as we can, to let them know that this is coming, this is going to be coming down the road. And the soonest it'll be on the step exams will be 2019. So if you want to ask me about this afterwards, I'd be more than happy to talk about it. But it's a general outline of what they think are the most important metabolic pathways that students should know. And it, it will be a, a piece of reference information that they can call up, which means you don't need to teach every step of the pathway, but instead focus in on the importance of the parts of the pathway, regulation, and things like that. Implicit in the use of the patient cases and their use in combining basic and clinical sciences is the use of resource sessions where we complement what the students are doing on their own. So our curriculum is very much uh, driven from the student side through their self-directed learning. We utilize our resource sessions to really deal with the patient case that they're considering at the time. You know, all the things related to construction of uh, the resource session or a lecture, starting simple, uh, spend time on more difficult aspects, and, and really having lots of redundancy in building on uh, previous experience. And then the last thing that I thought about last night that I need to build in is there's actually an important faculty part because um, we're not born with all this knowledge. So the faculty have to evolve and learn uh, as much as the students do. And we do, do this through a series of faculty sessions that are a combination of tutor meetings and guides to, for all of the interactive sessions that we have with the students. So we have guides to the electronic problem based learning modules, which are our patient cases. And then many cases, which we do uh, right before the mid unit exam and the end of the unit exam that build upon the concepts and the content that they've encountered so far. And they apply their knowledge to different situations, new situations that they haven't seen. And then we're always thinking about probing the students appropriately in terms of them getting experience, practice and experience dealing with the content and the concepts in all the different disciplines. So we use lots of those self-assessment questions, homework problems. Uh, and then at the last minute, I back the exams out for security reasons. Uh, and it's one of the things that we're always facing is making sure our exams don't get out. But I can share those. So uh, I think uh, just to put it in some uh, perspective and uh, context, we've got four years like everyone else. So this is getting modified based on the new year three curriculum that uh, Deb Clayman, our uh, associate dean of education, developed uh, a few years ago and has now uh, started this uh, last year. And it's in full operating mode right now this year. Uh, a change in year three such that students actually can graduate early if they're doing well. So some students can leave after the third year and begin residency or do something else before starting residence. But otherwise, we're very similar to many curricula where we are heavy with basic uh, science in the first two years with a good overlap of clinical science in years one and two. And then it transitions to more clinical science and revisiting some basic science. Uh, during years three and four. So our first two years comprise uh, overlap units of cardiorespiratory and renal, neuromuscular and behavioral, and then endocrine reproduction, gastrointestinal, and the extra unit in year 
two is in the policies of infection management community. So we have some standard units that we see all the time. And then disciplines that are associated with each year, in the first year would be anatomy all the way to population health and prevention. And in the second year, it's more on the path side. They get some more genetics, radiology, some more farm, path, you know, plasma and fish control. So our curriculum really is set up to revisit a number of issues during each of the first two years. And from a perspective as a biochemist, it sort of seemed natural that you should do a system-like approach to uh, learning about the human body because one can take a look at a cell see how a eukaryotic cell is put together and, you know, easily take biochemistry topics and say, well, you know, if you're looking at certain cells, you can sort of combine all this stuff at the same time and get an appreciation for how cells and tissues work when you're learning all this and applying it to a patient case. So as a biochemist, it struck me very early on that this is an easy thing to do for a cell. We can probably do it as educators and see how well it works. So how did we go about thinking about the kinds of patient cases that we want to develop in our first year. Well, I think the overriding uh, thought was that we should pick cases that had a lot of flexibility to them in terms of incorporating learning topics associated with the different disciplines each year. And then pick cases that were fairly common that you would see as a physician uh, on you know, either a daily basis or there would be a good chance that you would find these conditions in the patients that walk through the door. So in the unit that I coordinated, the cardiorespiratory renal unit, back when we redid our curriculum in 2000, we had a number of these cases when we first started our problem-based learning track and we just brought them over to the unified curriculum. So we start with a sickle cell disease case, which is actually a, an acute basal-occlusive crisis. And from a biochem standpoint, this is natural for taking a look at overviews of gene expression, looking at uh, going from a gene to a gene product, looking at the structure of, of proteins, looking at red blood cells and what they do, looking at metabolic pathways. It made perfect sense. Nice introductory case. We run it for four days for a very specific reason that I'll talk about in a minute. And then we jump to an embryology case, an atrial cephalic defect. We do this actually hit them with embryology in the beginning because most medical students are very much afraid of learning embryology for some reason that I'm starting to understand. But nowadays with YouTube and all the online lectures, embryology actually is very entertaining and you can learn a lot by going to the resources that are on the internet. And we're actually changing the minds of many of the students that are coming in that embryology is actually pretty straightforward. So we, we have built in an uh, embryology case. We go to pulmonary embolism, so we're starting to move to the lungs, and we're taking a look at uh, blood flow through the lungs, from the heart to the lungs, and differences between systemic and pulmonary blood flow. We get to look at coagulation uh, with pulmonary embolism and clinical markers from a biochemistry standpoint. We do a second lung case, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, another uh, condition that physicians see all the time. So we're moving now to gas exchange in the tubes and we're looking at uh, a combination of ventilation and perfusion within a patient. And then we transition over and go back and take a look at the heart in some more detail. So we started with embryology, but we come back right before the mid unit assessment and we consider the electrical conduction system of the heart and arrhythmias in general. And this is a supraventricular tachycardia, and it's a perfect opportunity from a biochemistry standpoint to look at G proteins and signal transduction. There's some overlap because we have a number of people in the physiology department who do quite a bit of this, so uh, it's, a, it's a nice little overlap where we can build interactions between faculty members. We then have a mid-unit assessment, and then we return right away, uh, two days after the assessment, we return to pretty standard acute myocardial infarction. And we learn a little bit more about coronary blood flow from a biochemistry standpoint. We look at cardiovascular disease and the formation of, of thrombuses, cardiac markers, breaking that thrombus down, uh, some things related to cardiac muscle contraction and energy generation that's needed for that. 
We then transition over to kidneys. And each year, at the end of the unit, the students all say, we should have done kidneys early because it would have been nice to have all that information from the start. But at the time, they appreciate the fact that the kidneys came a little later because it's overwhelming to dive into the kidneys from day one. So we start with something very simple, looking at the structure of the glomerulus, looking at the membrane structure, and we have an acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis that we work with, so we can look at the filtration barrier uh, from a biochemistry standpoint, amino acid processing, urea cycle. And then we move to a patient that has an electrolyte imbalance. So they really don't have a disease, but they have a condition that's actually fairly common, a patient who's on a diuretic who just happens to get sick. And they lose a lot of fluid. They have a typical volume contraction. They're set up for a metabolic alkalosis. And it's a nice patient to introduce because you're not necessarily going to figure out exactly what got the patient sick, but you have to learn why all these changes are occurring in that patient. So it's a nice little kidney case that follows that up. And they're going to see this quite often. You're going to have patients uh, who are on a variety of drugs, and some of them are on, many of them are on diuretics, especially as you get into uh, older populations. Uh, so it's something that we can see right away. And then the very last TVLM of the unit, before we do some more mini cases, is a case that puts all this together. So we have a congestive heart failure case. And it's a nice case because it puts heart, lungs, and kidneys all together, and it revisits many. Uh, concepts and content that they've had before. So it's a nice way to organize the unit, and the patient cases were thought of for the reason that it's a ni nice natural progression, and it's a good way to march them through the unit. And because it's the first unit, they're doing a number of things at the same time. And this is something that I emphasize not only to the students, but to people outside our university our, our med school is that many of these students, most of these students are coming into a problem-based learning yeah. curriculum who have no experience working in small groups previously. They have never done patient cases. They have never been in charge of their own learning, self-directed learning. They have never been told, use whatever resource that you think is effective. We do have some recommendations, but pretty much use what you can comprehend and as you move through the year, you will find the resources that work best for you. So the first unit, in addition to marching through these different cases and learning a bunch of stuff, is their learning process. How do you can conduct a history and a physical? Because they're combining all this stuff at the same time. And how do, what questions do you ask? Our patient cases are set up where they have to actually ask the question to get the information back. They have to conduct a physical assessment so that the case is set up where they want to do a pulmonary exam or a cardiovascular exam. They're going to get information back to them. And we're going to take a look at some aspects of these patient cases that we've been doing for the last two years now. Because you need, I, I told Lisa this morning, you need someone who's going to drive the car. And I like driving. I commute to work. And I'm given the liberty of driving the car wherever I think it's going to be effective for the student. So our unit has been the one that has started a lot of the innovation that we have seen over the past few years. So I'm going to show you some of the dirty details in terms of how to do this and why it's beneficial uh, for doing it. We also build in many cases, and these are to revisit learning issues or content and concepts that they've seen based on cases early in the year. So before the mid-unit, we come back to a set of shortness of breath mini cases, some genetic mini cases, lifestyle changes mini cases, and that all comes out of the first five cases that we do in the unit. They're seeing patients who are overweight or smoke uh, or drink, and we come back and they revisit all of those issues in different situations. Shortness of breath, they've seen shortness of breath so many times during the first unit they now know which way it can go. That if a patient comes in with shortness of breath, it's not necessarily a lung problem. So they get to apply this under different conditions. And then after the mid-unit, we follow up with looking at fluid and electrolyte mini cases, and then cardiovascular disease and hypertension mini cases, acid-based mini cases, shock mini cases. Uh, so they get a lot of experience. I took over the acid-based mini cases. 
four years ago and really uh, radically changed the approach to doing acid-base uh, in the first year. Uh, essentially learned from anesthesiologists how you do this and thought this actually makes a lot of sense and is much better than memorizing these little algorithms that have previously been taught because it's a, a nice way of taking advantage of the laboratory tests that a physician is getting exposed to. You get serum chemistries, you get arterial blood gases, but just looking at serum chemistries can give you a wealth of information about a patient. So our students actually get a lot of practice. Are they great at it? No, but they have a way of thinking about the problem that will save them most of the time. And then, as I said, we have built-in uh, homework problems that can be combination of multiple choice, true, false, that we're getting away from. Short answers, which we love, the students hate, because it's a question and they have to think of an answer. We're hoping they think of the answer before they go to the answer that can be contained at the end of the set. And sometimes I leave those answers out. And I get flack for doing it, but it's to force them to ask questions of the faculty if they have trouble. We have discussion forums that are hosted by BQL. So the best thing when you when you have homework problems is every so often leave the answer off, and that forces them to go to the discussion forum and ask the question. Because if they have the question, other people are going to have the question. So it's a lot easier to have this discussion and open it up to the classmates who many times offer a great answer and the faculty simply confirm it, or you can answer one question that affects everybody in the class, so it's a nice effective way. And then we follow up with the basic science exam, which is integrated. So it's fully integrated. Uh, we've got everything that they see during the electronic problem-based learning modules, that they see during the self-assessment questions. Everything that they've been exposed to, they will they can see on the mid-unit and so I'm just going to quickly just run through the other two units in the first year. So neuromuscular behavior. We've got uh, essentially a compartment syndrome problem in the forearm. And uh, this unit took a couple of different approaches when it started out. It first started out by working from the hand up to the brain. There were some cl complaints that said you really should start the brain and work out to the hand. It just makes more sense to do that. So they actually were brave when they started with the brain. And they quickly return to starting with the hand and going to the brain the very next year because the students didn't realize how complicated it was to start up with. And it was much better. So we have now settled on this for years to start at the hand. We then go to a C5-6 fracture. We then go into a classic muscular dystrophy. And it alternates between uh, Duchenne's and Becker's uh, from year to year. We've got a cranial nerve uh, lesion uh, that we then move to uh, a lesion in the cerebellum. We then move to uh, uh, changes that actually are biochemistry in nature, a thymine deficiency that leads to Wernicke syndrome. And then we finish up with one of uh, mental illnesses. So in this particular uh, uh, unit, it's schizophrenia because the year two curriculum has taken depression and bipolar and some other things for their ownership. So we deal with schizophrenia during the first year. They have a series of mini cases, vision, cortical, embryology, mental illness that they can follow up and revisit after we've actually done the uh, uh, problem-based learning modules. And then same time for things with assessments. The third unit in the first year starts out with a typical GERD case. We then move to diabetes, gallstones, celiac sprue, so this pretty much ends our gastrointestinal portion of the unit, and my chair, chair of our plasma department, is in charge of this half of the unit. And then it moves over to the physiology chair, who's a reproductive endocrinologist. So we actually, it's probably the only time we have a normal patient as part of a curriculum, which is sort of unusual. We always think that have a pathology, but we have a normal male, happens to be married to, uh, to a woman who, they're, as a couple, they're unable to conceive, so both patients can be worked. So it just turns out that he happens to be normal in terms of the workup, though there are some behavioral factors that, that play a role. And then we have a uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome that follows up in the female partner. And then we go to a pregnancy case that my chair wrote a number of years ago with one of the OBGYNs in the community. 
Uh, we move to the thyroid and the parathyroid, and we end up with a classic Cushing syndrome. So we can round all that out and then a series of many cases where we come back and revisit nutrition because we've, we've been looking at nutrition all year long, but we have a series of nutrition mini cases that we use and then some endocrinology cases related to growth or pituitary disorder. Now, I'd like to tell you that we do a great job on nutrition, but that would be a lie because the students, by and large, hate nutrition. And even though we have a problem-based curriculum, it's student-centered, it's patient-organized, for some reason, nutrition doesn't hit that in terms of something that's important to know. And the general comment from the students, by and large, with lots of exceptions, is the nutritionist or the dietitian is going to take care of it. There's nothing that involves me as a physician. And they could be further from the truth with that statement. But that's how they think about it during the first year for probably a number of reasons that you can guess. But even so, we follow up with nutrition mini cases to give them exposure to the kinds of uh, problems that they're going to encounter when they grow with the patient. So they treat the patient sort of, this is a problem, it will be solved, I move on. So this is something that we're still working on, and how to, and I think there's some psychology that we need to be thinking about in terms of approaching this business. Okay. So I'll move to the show you our calendar so you can put it in the context before I actually get into the electronic modules. So we start off the beginning of the year in the first unit. Remember, we're teaching process at the same time that we're doing all of the things that we need to learn. We've got three days a week that are set aside in the morning for the small group, tutor group uh, sessions that are required and where they're getting all the information, all the practice. Uh, in collecting histories, doing physical, in the context of the electronic patient. They do have clinical interactions at the same time where they are learning their clinical skills. And Tuesday is set aside for doing that. Thursday afternoon, after the first couple weeks, is set aside for going out into the community and working with a clinician. So they have two, one and a half days a week where they're out doing clinical activity. But they are practicing that when they're collecting information cases. So those are in the mornings. They're typically three hours we set aside unless we're doing an assessment for the very first day when we're starting the whole process and it will be four hours. We don't necessarily run all three hours because as the students get better at opening cases and learning how to develop learning issues, they get very effective and a tutor group can last an hour. So that means they have two more hours of that particular day to go off and start doing their own work which they like. Some of them go home and they sleep a little more. Sometimes we delay the start of group uh, to help them out. I wake up early. I like to start early and get finished early. So my groups get used to starting at 8 and being done something after that. We've got resource sessions that are set up for them. They're typically, they could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, if we need to fit in an hour, a 15-minute session, depending on faculty availability, but nominally, our resource sessions are Thursday mornings. These are sessions devoted to a topic or topics that faculty over the years have figured out aspects of the topic that are most difficult for students. They spend their time focusing in on what's most difficult. They can all read. They can understand the textbooks. They can go to the YouTube videos or the popular Dr. Najib videos and get everything they want from that. But what they can't get is the interaction of asking a question based on their misunderstanding or based on something that goes beyond what they read in the resources that they can use. So many of our resource sessions are actually set up as question and answer sessions where the faculty member is talking about something and then soon gets interrupted by the student that said, you know, I was reading this. Uh, how does this apply or why don't we approach it this way? So we use our resource, resource sessions in that manner. We typically don't have more than four 50-minute resource sessions for any particular week. So it's really limited in terms of the number of hours. The students would love more time, but our associate dean gets behind us and says, no, that's not how the curriculum is designed. So we really limit those kind of interactions. They can post things to D2L and get answers, or they can ask questions on the resource sessions or review sessions that happen before each exam. 
we do still have practical things in cells and anatomy. And I think there's an evolution uh, in terms of how histology and anatomy is done. Some schools have moved away from dissection, doing everything virtual, uh, or doing pro-dissection, uh, where someone goes in and does all this stuff ahead of time. But we still have uh, dissection in a typical uh, anatomy lab with cadavers that are done with the student. We deliberately run the first case four sessions, and that was a deliberate choice I made a number of years ago, because what we were finding is students would come for the first week, they'd leave that weekend, go home, party, and then they'd come in, and the expectation was the curriculum ran Monday to Friday, and that was it. So we broke the move that habit by running the first case for four sessions, which meant that first weekend, they were going away, they were missing out on some things, the work that they could be doing. And then because of that design, every case after that starts midweek or on a Friday and it runs over the weekend. So it gets them into the habit of always working on a patient case. So they might be working on two patients at the same time, finishing up one, working on self-assessment questions while starting a new case. And that's exactly what we're going to see down the road. So they need to start thinking about this. We follow up each one of our patient cases with a wrap that's run by either the director of doctoring when we can't get a clinician from the community to come in, but we do have some very nice uh, cardiologists and pulmonologists from the community and, and nephrologists who come in and they love talking to the students about their perspective of this particular patient. So we have some, some nice uh, case wraps that are done that are required uh, that we have a clinician coming in. And then we have a series of other things, unit meetings that I conduct tutor meetings for the faculty each time. We actually had a nice instance where a clinician came in. One of the cardiologists came in. He was late because he was coming from uh, the emergency room. Uh, he didn't have his presentation, and he, he did this on the fly. He had a couple of videos of some angiograms that he used to talk to the students, and it was probably one of the best case wraps that the students had that year because he did this all unprompted. They simply asked him questions as he was showing some videos. So it worked out very nicely. Uh, later on in the year, we've got many case sets up right before the, uh, the assessment. So we build in time where the students can request review sessions and do things like that. Then exam week, which is, you know, we have our basic science exam in the library on computers. Everything is done uh, over the internet. Lab practicals that are done in the lab. So nitty-gritty of doing patient cases. When I first started this, I took over as coordinator of the CR unit in 2004. And I think my first uh, two years, three years doing this, uh, I, was, I was the deer with the, with the headlights flashing in my eyes. And I, I just sort of was someone who ran a unit, unit trying not to break anything. And there were lots of things to break but there were lots of things to make better. And then I had a, an, what I consider probably my best opportunity so far was a colleague of mine from the Association of Biochemistry Educators that Mark is a member of. Janet Lindsley, who's at University of Utah, gave me a big break and asked if I was interested in serving the lead to write questions. So she asked this of the entire organization. I immediately sent my name in. And then sometime... Later that fall, I got a, uh, an, a phone call from the NBME asking me some questions. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Because the normal process is they, you go out there and you run through some things and you make sure you know what you're doing. And I had this 30-minute phone call where they were trying to assess me. And I guess I said the right thing because the next thing I knew was I was on a writing committee. And the rest is history. I've been associated with the NBME since then. So one of the things that I learned from being associated with the MBME and talking to the clinicians, both at home and the ones that I met in Philadelphia, was learning resources where I could get information as a basic scientist that would ground me and show me direction uh, to learn new things, but what I could be doing in terms of integrating basic and clinical sciences. So I really look at 2010 as a trans formative year for me 
that I've been continuing ever since and trying to educate some of our faculty about this. So the first resource that's the most important one is to make sure you've got ossifying clinicians around that you can go talk to. And I think that's not a problem here. We've got lots of people on faculty who would be a good resource. In Carbondale, we've got a few people on campus. Most of the people are in the uh, clinical environments outside of Carbondale. So they have private offices and they're associated with the hospital, which is off campus. So we are separate from the second year in Springfield where the hospital and the second, third, and fourth year are more integrated in terms of their interactions between clinicians and business doctors. So I find that talking with clinicians is most important. The next thing is to identify different resources that you can use that once you understand that it's a patient and there's different organ systems that function in that patient, that if you want to learn more as a basic scientist, there are some really great internet resources that can help you out. E-medicine is the first one I stumbled upon on Netscape, and I read this several times a week, and I add to my repertoire in terms of different conditions, because I'm always looking for new things to write clinical scenarios on, or questions, or developing uh, patient cases. The Merck Manual has a similar approach, the setup's a little differently, but both a combination of e-medicine and Merck Manual is a good place if you want to learn quickly, as a basic scientist, how to put clinical and basic science together. The NIH has a, a nice genetics uh, website that's good for getting lots of useful information if you are building upon interaction between, in terms of uh, genetic foundations with human diseases. And then up to date for the newest information uh, about anything can be found on up to date. And uh, I think starting last year, it was actually, it's been actually convenient for me to access up to date off campus. It used to be you had to be on campus to do this. You had to be sitting in your office to get access. And they've changed their access policy so now you can do it off campus. That said, up to date has to stay. So as a basic, basic scientist, I go into up to date, I will read some things and I'll take a deep breath after I read certain things because I'll know it's not correct. So it's like anything else. You have to read it and you have to be asking questions. But all of these resources are very good uh, resources to use when you're trying to learn about different diseases or disorders. We're actually getting specific information on patients so that you develop a feel for what a patient should look like. Or how tall should they be? What should they weigh? What should their BMI be? How quickly should their heart be beating? How quickly should they be breathing in and out? Which tells you nothing about ventilation, but simply tells you about their, their breathing rate. Uh, about kids, you know, what, is it, what should their temperature be? What should their blood pressure be? There's lots of useful resources that can get you up to speed and get a feel for the actual presentation of a patient. So you can start doing that. But if all else fails and you're not quite sure because it's not a condition that looks like the typical one, you always cycle back to number one. You ask the physician nearby, I've got this case I'm thinking about. What should these clinical uh, signs, these vital signs look like? Uh, for physical exams, heart and lung sound. Uh, a variety of resources out there, and this is something that I'll, I'll show you uh, in a minute. But there are schools that publish heart and lung sounds. If you have people that own the Lipman stethoscopes, they have online resources that you can use that we have tapped into over the years uh, for doing the newest thing that we do in our curriculum now, which is building in uh, heart and lung sounds for our patients. So EPBLM, so our typical uh, patient case. So our sickle cell disease case, which is actually a vasoacoustic crisis. Here's all the learning topics that we have built in to this patient case. So it's our starting case. So it's really an overview of genetics. How does this disease get inherited? So an overview of you know, single gene, but also other factors that become important in differentials basal crisis. An overview of looking at genes to gene product, so gene expression, an overview, do they remember how they came from their under 
graduate staff that was in Bainbridge, Florida. Hemoglobin structure seems that's the particular gene that's defective. They've got a, a beta globin allele that's defective, but they learn about the other hemoglobins at the same time. Taking a look at red blood cell counts, and, uh, complete blood count, taking a look at iron indices. So they have a bunch of hematology that we've built in that maybe they'll see in the second year, but it's just natural that it goes in the first year, so we'll just go ahead and do it. We look at red blood cells from both a histological and a biochemical perspective. You know, uh, structure and function of the spleen, so that's the introduction to anatomy. And the spleen is the first organ that they actually consider. Taking a look at the history or the pathogenesis of the disease. Child development. So their exposure to taking a look at some developmental milestones, behavioral signs related to interaction with the four-year-old patient. What can you do? What you can't do? Uh, immunology, inflammation and pain, because this particular patient doesn't want to be picked up, doesn't really want to talk to the physician. So what's behind the pain in this particular disease? The fact that red blood cells are getting lodged in uh, capillaries in the different tissues, and that is inciting this inflammatory response, ischemic crisis that's causing pain in those four cells. And then the medications that's being given to the patient to try to get rid of the pain. So we, we have all the major disciplines all folded into the first case. So in a way, it's an introduction to what we're going to do the entire first few years. And what we're hoping is they start thinking about a way, uh, our way of approaching a patient. A patient has all these different things. If you want to break it down by discipline, you can. If you simply want to go after topics that make sense, logically about a patient, you can do that. So we have it set up to handle all these things at the same time. So let me go ahead and get into the authoring software on this. Yeah. That case takes, we do four sessions. So it starts on a Monday, and we finish the next Monday. Yeah, it is. And they come back and they revisit that stuff, because they're not perfect at it. Some of them, we have some students that they fly through in their tutor group and they're the master of everything in that first case. And other people, they keep having to revisit those things. But we build upon them. So they're not expected to be perfect after the first week. But they've been exposed to those topics. And that's the whole thing, is the exposure and the fact that you have to go back and repeat. We started with two curricula. We started with a, a traditional lecture-based curriculum that we called Sequence 1. And most of the class, I would say, all except um, 18 students were part of the traditional curriculum. 18 students, so three tutor groups of six, were part of the problem-based learning curriculum. And that ran from when we started to year uh, 1999. In 99, we extended four tutor groups. And then in 2000, we were told, because of budgetary constraints, that we needed to do something about two curricula. We couldn't offer it anymore. And we went to a hybrid, which essentially was the problem-based learning curriculum with the supporting resource sessions. Other questions? Yeah. Well, the, base, the clinicians that come in during year one, we come in to do case wraps. And their basic science background, by and large, has been really good. And fortunately, we have not needed to do anything for them. They know their, the cardiologists know their stuff, the nephrologist knows his stuff, the pulmonologist knows his stuff. In year two, we actually have the MDs as part of the unit. So we have MDs part of the program. They've got a basic scientist that they can be interacting with right away. Uh, do you want to ask me a more specific question that I can give examples of? Yeah. 
one of the things, yeah, one of the things that we were charged with early on was making sure we had a diverse set of electronic patients that we saw. So young Jamal is, uh, he's adopted from Liberia. So it presents a number of issues. So he's part of a minority population that comes in. He's also adopted a child, so it sets up behavioral aspects of the case. The parents don't know his history because they're limited by the information the orphanage has given them. And that actually sets up some interesting conversations, but it's only four sessions, so we're not able to explode that more than that, but it exposes them to those things. Each one of the cases we have diversified, so the many cases when I took over, I think was pretty non-diverse. They all had the name John Smith or Bill Jones or Sally something, something like that. And the first thing I did was change it all so they were from all over the world. So they all had different aspects. But, you know, in a way, sometimes that doesn't help. The students look at that and they make fun of the names. So, oh, well, I wonder where this patient's from. It's like there's a psychology, to, and it's evolved over the years. There's a psychology that has evolved during our first year where the patient is not, the background of the patient doesn't become the focus. The focus is, what do I need to know for the exams now? And it's really hard. And we're trying to break that. But it always reverts back to, you know, where's this patient from? Are there any specific things you need to be thinking about? It's getting more difficult because they are more, and they, they are more focused on what's going to happen after medical school in the first year than they have ever been in previous years. They are, many of them are so worried about residency right now that that's what's driving what they're doing. And we've got to change that. So let me just show you some aspects of what we've done. You know, we have a question bank where you want to ask a question about the, the uh, patient. So they will learn to type in parts of words where they can... Uh, find out what's going on with the patient, you know, what other symptoms does the patient have, and they will get answers to, to questions. But the thing that we did differently a couple years ago is we started to change how we conducted exams in the electronic patients. And what we did is instead of giving descriptions to support what our doctoring faculty were doing, is we went straight to sounds. So instead of telling them what the heart sounded like, we went to, you know, here's the auscultation. So there's a link to the heart sound. That, and this is nice because technology is perfect. So there's the heart sound. And so the first question is, well, what does that sound like to you? Well, it sounds like a heartbeat. Oh, okay. Any other information you can get from that? I don't know. Pretty quick. With the Littman stethoscope, it was just a matter of logging onto the website, downloading the resources from their website. And now it's included, I think, in the CD or something that they send with the stethoscope. And then you can find it. We have a stethoscope in house. I just checked it out and set it up. It was the first time to use it. So I, I set it up and found all the resources and started to use it. So we asked them, well, how fast is the heart beating? Can you figure that out? They're there with their, you know, cell phones, or some of them still have watches, and they're counting and they're figuring out the heart rate. But the neat thing, one of the physiologists, who's retired, but he developed DXR, which is the clinical reasoning software that's out there. Uh, Hurley Meyer, still the CEO of DXR. And what we did is we decided to include phono. I decided to include phonocardiogram with uh, heart sounds for the simple reason is we have students that come in, a few students come in that have hearing difficulties, okay? And phonocardiograms are just perfect because you can look at the phonocardiogram and you can get information that you might not be able to get by listening to the heart sound depending on how you're hearing it. So we have the phonocardiograms that match. So to do this, there's a piece of software that is free and it's on the big site that has all the software, but the software is called Audacity. 
And Audacity allows you to uh, process audio. And one of the nice things is it automatically produces the funny party dance for you. There are apps out there that are struggling to do that. Uh, the Whitman stethoscope will produce the funny party dance. So we just have it built in now to our patients so that they get the sound and they get the phonocardiogram at the same time. So they can see the S1 and the S2. You know, for other patients, there'll be a splitting of S2. Other patients, there'll be an S3 or an S4. And students early on have trouble figuring out whether it's an S3 or S4 because they have trouble figuring out if it's S1 or S2 just by listening to the sound. But if they're there actually learning their clinical exam, they know to be checking for the pulse or for the carotid and then they can get oriented to the actual sound. So we had built that into the phonocardiogram by just putting a label where the impulses occur. So this is something that I did on the fly this past year because students were having trouble for some reason. And we just built in, you know, the photocardiogram, you know, about an hour after the students were having difficulty. Um, so this is something that goes after the fact. For some of the cases, we go ahead and just indicate where you typically you see your impulse, and that can orient them to uh, the sounds that they're hearing. We also have lung sounds that are part of the case that we can do. So if you do a pulmonary exam, we have the same thing. Instead of telling them what they hear, So that's relatively normal breathing. We have cases where you've got crackles, wheezes, uh, rails. Uh, the students get exposure to the different sounds. Now, there are uh, phonograms associated with pulmonary system, but they're not as standardized and accepted as they are uh, with uh, as heart sounds. So we have a, a case where we've got arrhythmias. The one nice thing that we've been able to do for this particular case So we can actually put videos on here. Our server is limited in terms of the size of files, but it's usually pretty good for for most things that we want to post. So with this particular patient, they have a mitral valve prolapse. We can't find the perfect uh, prolapse, so we have some representative ones. And we have those that we can show the students. And there's a nice piece of software for doing this called VLC, the Video Converter. But it allows you to take a look at video. So we have these built into the patient cases also. So some of the other things. Get out of here. And we'll come back. So we have, these are the newest things that we added to our cases. This was the last new case that was written. This was written last summer. We had a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis case that was very atypical. And it was actually a case of uh, membranous glomerulonephritis, but we really wanted a very straightforward case. So it's very easy to go back into the authoring software, talk to clinicians, what should vital signs be like, though I'm at the point where I can do this on my own but it's very easy to talk to clinicians about what should the test results should be, what should complement levels be in this patient at this particular point in time. And it was very easy to generate a, a new case. It took maybe uh, a good part of a week to generate all the answers to the history questions, update the physical, and then 
be put to test. They're, they're developing the learning issues on their own as they're opening this case up. So they're developing learning issues. They collect the information about the patient. They have history physical. They may not know what the problem is, but they have some key pieces, uh, some key pieces of information with this patient. There is a very high protein content in the urine. Why is that? That one question drives them to figuring out that there's a problem with the glomerulus. They then learn about the structure and the function of the glomerulus on their own. And they're a small tutor group. So they have seven colleagues, and they are working on this problem together. They work either together in their tutor group after the three hours that they're together, or they work by themselves at home, and then they come together. My tutor groups, for some strange reason, they get together the night before the next session, and they actually conduct their own tutor group. They practice before that we actually have the tutor group the next morning. Which I don't understand the reason for that. But it turns out they're very effective when they're organized. The, the people that have more trouble are able to learn from their colleagues, which is great. So it's a nice strategy that they have. They're teaching themselves on the first pass about each one of these learning issues. We then follow it up with a discussion in tutor group where the tutor is driving with questions about do you really understand this? And the tutors aren't necessarily experts, but they've got a tutor guide. They've got probes that they can ask. And as they get used to doing this case, they ask better questions. The history and the physical, the same clues that a clinician gets when they go in to see a patient. So they're getting the same information. We don't tell them what the diagnosis is. They figure it out on their own. They're so interested in getting the diagnosis sometimes that we have to pull them back to pay more attention to the basic science. But we're always getting them back to applying the basic science to that case. Yes, you're learning diagnoses, you're learning differentials, which is probably more important than the diagnosis, but it's really understanding the basic science and the clinical science that's going to save you when you get your next patient coming through the door. They're doing the first pass on their own. We then follow it up, as I said, with the resource sessions and those interactions. And then we're supporting doctoring because doctoring goes over the same kinds of uh, skills of collecting data on a patient. So we're trying to work together with them to do all this. We have resource sessions that are set up. I don't need to run through examples. But I think the biggest thing that we've been able to say related to our curriculum over the years, and this is a, a graph that Deb Clayman lent me last year, but it shows the percentile on the MCATs, and then it shows the percentile on step one and step two on the boards, and that you can see that there's a percentile increase. And there's a pretty good correlation between MCAT and board scores. And that's been in the literature for years. And what we see is we see this from when we started the, high, the, the C2000 curriculum, we see this nice gap between what they come in and how they perform on the board. So they're actually learning something by going through our curriculum. They're not tracking at the same percentile. There's a value, what's called a value added to going through the curriculum. And I guess there's some, there should be some new data for this year. And then there's supporting literature. So if you've got any questions about what we should do, there's lots of literature out there on, you know, importance of lectures, how you should do lectures if you're going to do them, what kind of interactions work best. Is self-directed learning important? For what reasons? How effective it is? There's a bunch of literature out there, and we have to remember that people have studied the pedagogy enough so that there are some good principles that come from the basic theory behind the, from the educational people that support what we're doing. There's a really good person, and if you haven't had her here, I highly re uh, recommend getting her down here. Nikki Woods from the Wilson Center, University of Toronto is working on a number of things related to medical education, combining basic and clinical sciences, long-term retention of information. Nikki is a great person. She is doing some really nice things each year. So I just want to re remind you that when you're developing patient cases to integrate basic and clinical sciences, think about your curriculum. What are your constraints? What are your resources? Where can I find new information? 
you're constantly updating. You're reacting to what the students are finding when they actually experience. So one of the things that we end up doing is we don't simply stick to what we do, but we're constantly getting feedback from the students. And as I say, in our unit, at least, we're, we're doing it on the fly. So if someone comes back and says, you know, that's no longer standard of care, I go back and check to make sure because we're usually pretty close all the time because we're constantly looking at it. But there are some things that we'll, we will miss every once in a while, and especially when a clinician comes in and say, you know, this patient would be worked up differently now. And we go back and we will change it. So you're constantly taking a look at your resources. So it's important to do that for the students because they like cases that are as real as they can get without getting the real patient in front of you, which we can't do in our tutor groups. But equally important is you've got to keep your faculty uh, educated about what's going on in the curriculum. So we have to keep everybody on the same page. So I think that's all I wanted to talk to you about. So I thank you for taking more of your time than I anticipated. But any questions that you have, I am more than happy to spend time talking about things. Um, I would say yes and no. I think some students would say that the first cases are really difficult and they get easier as they go along because they're learning the process. So there's some cases they think are easier to approach. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the learning issues, the topics that are associated with cases, are simple to start and then get more difficult. I think they build on each other so that when they go back and think about a learning issue with the previous case, they realize that there's more involved. Uh, then there's more involved with that learning issue than they initially thought when they add to it. So we have this built-in redundancy. It may look simple when they start. They may only cover certain things, but they get to go back to it and realize there's actually more things involved, understanding ventilation in a person's block. Okay. So I don't think the, the cases are set up to be more difficult. I think they're set up to introduce them and then encourage them to go back and think about what they've learned before and now apply it to a new situation so that they have a better understanding. So in that way, it, maybe it gets more difficult. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's a building process, and we're constantly revisiting things that they saw earlier in the year. Other questions? No, they don't know what's coming next. They don't know what they're starting with. They know the presentation. No, 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 they're not told that. The tutor's job is to get them to discover that. And they do that through the information built into the case. So they see this patient, Toussaint Duran, from Haiti. He's a well-spoken young man, so they're kind of surprised that someone from Haiti comes in and speaks perfect English, but he's a nice guy, and he loves playing basketball, And uh, but he's not quite sure of his gender. But we actually have a very interesting learning issue that pops up in the, in the first unit that the students really aren't thinking very much about. But the big problem is he comes in because he has to attend his sports physical, and he notices that his urine has changed color. And the sports physical, they, they see that, plus they tell them that you've got, you know, you've got an abnormal urinalysis. You should make an appointment to see your family doc about this. Goes to the family doc with the results, and they run a test, and he says, sure enough, your protein level is really high. You've got protein, high levels of protein in your urine, and that piece of information, when they look up high urine protein immediately draws their attention to the genetics because that's how it would get there based on the presentation of that patient. So we don't have to tell them anything. They get it through the discovery process. We have resource sessions which you can call lectures where there's a topic. So the renal physiologist would come in after the case is completed 
because we like to delay our resource sessions to after they've done their work. Or sometimes we'll do it during the case if it's long enough, but we'll do it after they've done that set of topics. And she'll come in and she'll talk about the setup of the nephron and how it filters. They help. Yeah, they're lectures, but they focus in on what's most difficult. It doesn't give them all the information. It's not all Q&A, but a lot of it is Q&A. It depends on the session. But a lot of this is revisiting. So the resource sessions now are becoming, well, we've already seen this. Tell me something more. So we're getting more questions over the last few years, in part because of the MCAT change. We're getting more questions during resource sessions where the students read all this stuff ahead of time. They know it. They now come in with more specific questions. Yeah, we, we have recommended textbook list. Yeah, each, each of the units publishes a recommended list, which has now been incorporated on a master resource in our medical resource center, our library on the Carbondale campus. They have a website, and they have a bunch of resources on there, and they list it by discipline. We don't necessarily tell them which one to use for any case, but we just say, here are resources that you can use, and faculty will rate the resource, tell them what it's strong in, what its weaknesses are, which ones are good, which ones we don't like. Um, but students do that, but it's amazing. Even at the end of the first unit, we have students who first contact that recommended list. They never use it. Yeah, and so they get to choose a group and they realize that Wikipedia doesn't answer all the questions that they need to be able to answer to understand that. But they do start with Wiki. And so some things Wiki is okay. For a lot of things, Wiki falls well short, and they realize that. The, the good students know it right away. The poor students stick with Wiki until they get the first exam back. And then the major rearrangement occurs where they start saying, well, what books should I be using and what resources? And they've discovered what they've been told before and start to make that transformation. Trying to become a better adult mom. So we do a lot of modeling for them. But some take different amounts of time to do it, and it's natural. But all of it's built into doing the history and the physical. Sickle cell case, what's driving is the patient doesn't want to be picked up. What's the problem? What do we know from the history? Well, you know, the patient, you know, all these background tests were run on this patient from the orphanage, and they all came back negative. He didn't have any disease. The orphanage simply wanted to get adopted. And then they find out at six months there was a rash. Two years there was a serious rash and a lot of pain. He's in it four. He's got that rash again. He's got more serious pain. The localized, uh, more localized to the bone parts of the bone. They put that information together and they figure out. Hmm. I think we know what's going on here. So part of what's really driving this is the differential. Every attribute, every piece of information that they collect, every attribute needs a differential. So they're learning this connection between attributes and differentials. And they, as they get more comfortable with that, it drives them to the one which is the highest level. And then they have self-assessment questions. Thank you for your time. <laughs> That's from Stanford, and you can get the you can get the, the latest one by signing on with the email.